coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Some of the biggest Call of Duty, Overwatch, and Hurtsome eSport leagues will be streamed exclusively on YouTube. Rocket League is ending support for Linux and Steam OS. We're in an Antarctica frenzy as Google Earth, as Google Earth user has found a 2,000-foot structure emerging from the snow. And sometimes free isn't actually free at all. It's been revealed that a vast free antivirus is tracking users' online behavior and mining the data. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Jeff Weston and Robbie Ferguson. All right, some quick honorable mentions this week. Uh, the good old FreeDB CD database service that uh, and its services will be shut down on March 31st, 2020. Now, there are dozens of applications that make it uh, easy to rip a music CD to your computer, saving digital versions of the tracks as MP3 or WAV or FLAC or even other audio files. But one of the key services many of those applications rely on is set to shut down at the end of March. FreeDB is a free online database of track listings of millions of CDs. Without this type of database, you'd either end up having to um, have a bunch of nameless files, or you'd have to manually type in the album names, the artist info, the song titles, and other data into your computer every time you rip a CD. While FreeDB isn't the only service of its type, it's been one of the most prominent services providing track listing data for nearly two decades. FreeDB data was originally based on information from the CDDB data service, uh, which eventually became proprietary software and prohibited lic uh, unlicensed applications from using the data. So FreeDB, wow, FreeDB, CDDB, it all runs together, doesn't it? Uh, but they are a free service operated under a GPL license, and it now consists of user-generated data. So service company Magix acquired FreeDB in 2006 and continued to support the free service until now. It's unclear why Magix has decided to pull the plug after all of these years. Fortunately, there's an alternative online music database called Music Brains that's operated under a Creative Commons license that effectively places the data into the public domain, uh, which means it should continue to work with third-party software indefinitely, no matter what. But if you're using an old CD ripping service or music management software that only supports FreeDB, it may be time to look for some kind of alternative. In an odd turn of events, Microsoft has had to push out an update for Windows 7, despite the operating system reaching end of support because they need to fix a bug that they introduced. Earlier this month, Microsoft ended support for Windows 7 and released final public security updates for computers still running the over a decade old OS. However, that final update included the addition of a bug that affects desktop wallpapers, causing wallpapers set to stretch mode to display as a black screen. Organizations who wish to continue using Windows 7 beyond the end of support date must pay for extended security updates. In other words, Microsoft ended support for Windows 7 by introducing a bug that companies would have to pay them to fix. Initially, Microsoft said it was developing a fix that they would roll out to those who purchased extended support. However, they've since caved. They've changed their minds and patched uh, the patches being made available to everybody running Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2 SP1, which was also affected. Wow. Finally, at FOSDEM this week, Pine64 have announced what they're up to for the first half of 2020. During this time, the company hopes to review the status of the Pine Phone and Pine Time, release the Pine Tab Early Adopter Edition, and make good on their promises to deliver the upgrade kit for the original Pine Book. Also rolled over from last week's to-do list, or last week's, last year's to-do list. They're falling a little further behind than just one week. Pine64 is releasing a new Sopine compute module that features a neural processing unit. 
The So Edge is a three tops module that can be paired with the So Pine baseboard or USB 3.0 and PCI Express adapters for development. And it can even be mixed with previous Gen A64 modules on the cluster board, which allows clustering of up to seven compute modules. It can connect to a single board computer such as the Rock Pro 64 or a regular PC with a simple PCI Express riser card. Now, Having en encountered issues with the Sony camera implementation and with the big devices that they've been releasing, like the Pinebook Pro and the Pine Phone um, in the works in Q4 2019, the Cube camera got put on the back burner. But Pine64 also assures us that they are once again working on that. They're going to need to make some modifications to the specs, though, and we're going to learn more about that in Pine64's February community update, which is going to be posted on February 15th. So that's a lot of stuff that has been rolled over from 2019 into 2020, uh, which is going to keep them very busy. But at this point, Pine64 is also wanting to announce things that they are confident they're going to be able to deliver early May 2020 uh, at, as a deadline. So anything that's going to be released in the first couple of quarters this year. It's been a while since Pine64 has announced a new single board computer. And in fact, um, with all of the other devices that they've been bringing out, some users have even questioned if they're going to be getting out of the SBC industry altogether, but that is not the case. Pine64 has announced the new Hard Rock 64. The Hard Rock 64 features the same SB, uh, SOC. It's the RK3399 Hexacore SOC that you find in the Pinebook Pro and the Rock Pro 64. It's got two USB 3, two USB 2 ports, Wi-Fi AC, Bluetooth 5.0, gig Ethernet. And unlike the Raspberry Pi 4, which only offers micro SD for storage, the Hard Rock 64 includes eMMC. Nice. Also, the contrast, uh, also by contrast, the Hard Rock 64 has a barrel jack for power and no USB-C. Like the Raspberry Pi 6, uh, Raspberry Pi 4, it comes in three different RAM sizes. There's one gigabyte, two gigabytes, and four gigabytes. The three implementations of the Hard Rock 64 will be available at around $35, $45, and $55, respectively. The board is going to run Rock Pro 64 OS images, and with a small tweak, it should even be able to run most of the Pinebook Pro distros as well. So if you don't need all of the Rock Pro 64's functionality, such as PCI Express or USB-C, then this may be the perfect board for you. Pine64 hopes to have the Hard Rock Pro Hard Rock 64. <laughs> <laughs> All of them start to run together. They hope to have it available for you this April. Nice. That is awesome. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. Some of the biggest Call of Duty, Overwatch, and Hearthstone esports leagues will be streamed exclusively on YouTube. The deal scene is a big win for the platform, which has found it hard to compete with the game streamer Twitch. It's part of a deal that the site's signed with Activision Blizzard, the company which runs the leagues, Twitch exclusively streamed for the first two seasons of Overwatch League and is seen as the go-to destination for live gaming. For sure. Sunil Ryan, head of gaming at Google Cloud, says, quote, We've worked closely with Activision Blizzard for the past few years across mobile titles to boost its analytics capabilities and overall player experience. We're excited to now expand our relationship and help power one of the largest and most renowned game developers in the world, end quote. Despite being the largest video site in the world, YouTube has historically struggled to compete with sites like Twitch. But in the last few months, the platform's been making some high-profile moves, poaching a number of high-profile Twitch streamers. As a part of the deal, the search giant's cloud platform will power all of Activision Blizzard's game hosting and other technical needs. Google Cloud will also host Activision Blizzard's entire library of games. That's a, quite a change in, in the landscape of video games gameplay on online it, it is twitch has always been like that's where you go for gameplay well yeah and i mean the fact that they've now just secured those three games makes me wonder could this 
either force Twitch to adapt or mm. put them under. Be, be the end, yeah. Like, if YouTube can start pulling away from Twitch and saying, you know what, we've got this, yeah. and if they can show that, hey, we've done it better, right? then mm -hmm. other Twitch streamers are going to go, eh, you know what, I can go here. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting, though, is it talked about the fact that they pulled some of the high-profile Twitch streamers, so I'm wondering if there's a different compensation rate versus what you would normally get on, on YouTube. It's a really weird landscape, though, because we can't produce video on YouTube for children. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, the so the games are going to have to be adult centric. Uh, I, or at least the, the, to be, the commentary. To be honest with most of these, they already are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so what we're going to see, so understand what that means is that, okay, so the YouTube game, uh, like the, the community of gamers on YouTube is going to grow into an adult centric video service. Right. So, well, so then maybe like Twitch foul language, um, probably well, some not necessarily. Um, I mean, yeah, necessarily. I mean, you're you're gonna get some of it for sure. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you look at some of those older YouTubers like Dan TDM, who's been around forever. Yeah, but how's he doing with YouTube right now? As far as I know, he's still doing videos. My kids are watching him all the time. How are the ads looking? Hmm. I That's haven't question. noticed anything. I don't know. I'd have to check on, on Dan and see how things are going. But the, see, the thing is, is that as soon as COPPA came in, it really impacted streamers who, yes. like Dan has always been very, he's been very centric on, on children and uh, ch children's entertainment. Yes. And because of that, that will impact his revenue because under COPPA, he is not allowed to generate revenue based on children viewing his stream. Right. So, he would have to generate adult centric videos in order to generate any revenue. Now, I mean, at the end of the day though, YouTube isn't going to know whether it's me on my phone watching or my kids on my phone, but even if right, like, regardless, but of Dan the, can't uh, take that risk. No, I hear you. But I mean, how, how does that force the content to change? Because Dan has to select. So we're talking about Dan TDM here. Yeah. He has to select when he creates a video that this is created for children. That the, that the content is appealing to children. And if he selects right. that, he is not allowed to monetize it. So whether it's you mm. or whether it's a child watching it, there are no ads that are monetizing it for him. So he's, right. not, ma he's not making any money off of those videos. So then he just says it's for adults. Somebody came into... Very, yeah, but, very, very young adults. But if a child is... See, then he's taking a risk because it's not. And they could shut him down very, very quickly. Right. Fair right? enough. Okay. And this so is a legal issue. It'll be interesting yeah. to see with, with this switch then, because you're right. A lot of the viewers are teens. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I mean, when it comes to 13 plus is okay. Oh, then they're full. Yeah. They're fine. Yeah. But as soon as any, anyone under 13 is watching that, that has to be selected by the streamer. Right. And if it is selected by the streamer, we're not allowed to monetize it. So then, I mean, with oh. the switch from Twitch to YouTube, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact because all of those games at the end of the day, when you look at the, was it, e, uh, ERT rating or whatever. Yes, but, but right now on Twitch, nobody's monitoring. Kappa hasn't cracked down on Twitch. So Twitch. So those, yes. those streamers are still making money off of the 10 year olds. That's right. Right. So right? Twitch is still. Which I, I'm not saying whether I agree or don't agree. I'm just saying that. So th that is going to be a strange shift because in, in order to monetize, they have to specifically make their programming for 13 plus. They cannot create programming that is appealing to 10 year olds. Right. To 11 year olds, to 12 year olds. But the difference between a 10 year old and a 13 year old, not really that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I guess I'm just viewing it from a different lens than you. I can say I'm gearing it to 13 year olds <laughs> and if a 10 year old watch it, so be it. No, but I'm can't. gearing it for but 13 not... because the law will crack down on you with that attitude. It's so weird. Yeah. But, but if that's okay. the case, I mean, how many kids do you like? I mean, I remember getting uh, movies rented that were 18 a no, sorry, R. Are, You're like, the church so, boy. Like horror flicks and stuff <laughs> when I was 14. So like uh, you can't stop. We're, yeah, we're not going to be able to solve this we, in this moment. That we is... cannot account for your crimes, Jeff. <laughs> I think this is fine. I don't think, I don't think they're going to notice an issue. I really don't. I oh, think dear. they're going to be able to, to stream on YouTube and I think they'll be fine. We'll see. 
Okay. What the, do you the, think? The, the initial blip Comment will below. be them getting are you a streamer? new subscribers. Are you a game streamer on Twitch? What are your opinions? Let us know. Comment below. Yeah, please. Just three and a bit years after it debuted on the platform, Rocket League is ending support for Linux and Steam OS. Psyonix, the development team behind the popular Cars Meets Football game, announced the end of Mac OS and Linux support in a short statement posted on their website. They say, quote, as we continue to upgrade Rock Rocket League with new technologies, it is no longer viable for us to maintain support for the Mac OS and Linux Linux or Steam OS platforms. As a result, the patch for the OS and the Linux versions of the game will be in March. This update will disable online functionality such as in-game purchases for players on Mac OS and Linux, but offline features including local matches and split-screen play will still be accessible." End quote. Last year, Psyonix was acquired by Epic Games, who announced plans to stop selling the hit game on Steam, though without impacting players who had already purchased it. But it's not all bad news. If you already own the game, you can continue to play it on Linux without any limitations until the March update arrives. After this, you can also continue to play it just without any of the online capabilities. Don't forget that if you bought Rocket League for Linux on Steam, you can still access full functionality, including online play, by installing it on a computer running a supported version of Windows. Not an ideal solution, but at least you don't totally lose your purchase. Burn, Linux yeah. users. What? I agree. However, how many avid gamers are Linux users? All of them. Yes. I like to believe. But you don't see people using Linux for the purposes of gaming. That is, maybe, that is true. Maybe that's part of this, too, is that, okay, my kids play that on the Switch. Rocket League is like the Nintendo Switch all the right. way. Now, right now, yeah, yeah, I'd say the Switch is where it's at. So. I will say that we had to install window, wah, wah, Windows on oh, my for computer gaming. because of gaming. Uh, because right. you got the VR headset and everything. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. But for sure. But that's why that's, I have... Windows on my computer. Like, I have Steam with my 300 okay. games on it. Yeah, fair enough. And so, for that reason, I, I need can Windows. I, can I have access to your account? We'll 400 see. games? You can share About your library. I have three I games. You can share I, your I've had, I signed up for Steam when it initially <clears throat> came out. After the show, in the credits, watch for it. We're going to have Jeff's Steam password. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't think this is such a big deal. I mean, you typically don't see gamers running on Linux. And but if, here's the thing. I, I wish that it was a big deal. I wish that there was more of a, a wave toward Linux. Sure. Based. Yeah, Jeff, I, I think. I agree. But the you're looking at it in the current, in the current, um, like this is now. Yep. Not a lot of gamers on Linux. Okay. So think about this. Well, the, the product's already on Linux. Yeah. Let's keep supporting it and let's, continue supporting Linux as a gaming platform because it's a great gaming platform. But Steam, if they're, Steam OS, for right. example. But if right? from a monetary standpoint, they're finding that the return on investment for having programmers that will deal with it on a Linux base is not viable on the long term based on subscribership, then it totally makes sense. It's a business decision. I can't, yeah. fa I can't fault somebody for that. I don't know. I feel like it's a build it and they will come sort of situation. They just need I'm to I'm sorry. They are kind of, they're not Kevin Costner. And we're not dealing with ghosts. All I care is that Unreal Tournament runs on Linux. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care about anything else in this that entire is the world. That's one thing. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That's but true. that's how, uh, you know, that's, 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 I mean, it's unfortunate that to me. they're not investing in Linux right. anymore, but yeah. uh, it doesn't surprise me. Mm hmm. I mean, yeah. it's not like you go. It still breaks my heart, Jeff. It oh, is sure. Sad. Yeah. I still, I wish that I could choose a different operating system but i need windows to play my games i need to, okay i need to. Right. so okay. dual booting is a, a dual booting for the win so yes. windows 10 for gaming linux for linux everything for else all that's other what things. I everything else but it doesn't have to be that way game developers need to realize that's right exactly we could just have linux and then Link. make this world a better place da vinci resolve is on linux so just bring bring rocket league back <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> 
Okay, we've got to take a quick break. More of this week's top tech new tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. We're in an Antarctica frenzy as Google, a Google Earth user has found a 2,000 foot structure emerging from the snow. Google Earth users have claimed for years that there are mysteries lying beneath the Antarctica ice. And now Google, user, er, Google Earth user Mr. MBB333 thinks he may have discovered a gigantic building in Antarctica. In footage shared a couple of weeks back, he zooms in on the location to find what seems like a huge square emerging from the ice. The narrator explains, quote, from the top to bottom, it's nearly 2,000 feet. Unbelievable. I didn't think it was that big. It's six football fields long. That's massive. It's very large, very symmetrical, and looks like a building. This could be a random piece of ice, I suppose. It is kind of offshore. Maybe it's some sort of building, but that is huge, end quote. While many are speculating what the shape could be, others are less convinced, suggesting it was nothing more than an unusual shaped block of ice. Antarctica is often the center of conspiracy theories, with so-called truth seekers believing that beneath the layer of snow and ice lies remnants of everything from ancient civilizations to Nazi bases. Back in August, another Google Earth user believed that they had spotted a gigantic statue of a face. And just two weeks ago, one person claimed to have spotted a huge two-mile-long ancient wall rising above the ice. The so-called monolith was compared to a ziggurat, a massive structure built in ancient Mesopotamia and Iran. Isn't that cool that we live in a time right now that we, as like just average users yeah. at home can look from the satellite basically down on the and earth be like, I like that's that. sci-fi from the 80s exactly. right there yeah okay but here's what i have to say about this and i i don't know whether or not these structures actually exist but to me it's reminiscent of like gazing at the clouds and being like i see a hippopotamus I don't know. It looks pretty <laughs> much like a structure to yeah. me. It could be a structure. Do you or remember not. It the could be. great Google Earth murder mystery? No. Never of, heard about of that. Of the dock with the blood splatter and the trail into the water? No. And everybody was freaking out about this murder do you, scene. Do which, you know about this? It, it's, it's kind this, of ringing. This about. happened probably five, six years ago, and everybody was freaking out that they had, that Google Earth had taken a snapshot of a murder scene. Oh. And because you see the dock, you see the, the trail of blood to the water. This has gotten really morbid. Right. But all of a out, sudden. Turns out. Yeah. It was a guy with his dog, and the dog was jumping in the water, running around, running across the dock, and it was the, the wet water. dock, and it made it look like blood. So the, the point of this is just because you see it on Google Earth doesn't mean it is what you think it is. That's true. But there's not a whole lot of action going on in Antarctica. But it doesn't matter. You can't look at something as a topographical view oh, yeah, 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 yeah. and go, look, it's, it's 2,000 feet tall. Oh, look at that. It's, the, it's actually the shadow of a penguin. Right? I, like, yeah. come on. I will say I spend some time in Google Earth on my VR. Like, yeah. And by some time, I mean on the daily because um, I love to travel around and just see places. So mm -hmm. I now need to go to Antarctica because I haven't. Oh. But I, I just, I mean, I don't, I, first off, it's Antarctica. So no matter where, where you are in the world at the end of the, not the world, but like this time of year, you're always going to have the sun at a very horizontal angle. So it's going to create different shadows. That's why that penguin looks like a giant building. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not buying it. I don't think so. No? I don't think it's a 2,000 foot structure. The amount of planes and surveillance, an story. it's not going to happen. I think the only valid use for Google Earth is to see where viewers are watching from <laughs> right now. Right. And, and so by clicking on to map.cat5.tv, we can start to see just outside of the royal town of Sutton Coldfield, we've got viewers and we should be able to zoom all over the place. Yeah. Viewers, 
all of, where are we right now? This I don't is, know. You're quite zoomed in. I know. Oh, there's oh, Denmark. Denmark. Yeah, we mm-hmm. know Denmark. <laughs> so this is this is a valid this use is for awesome. Oh, there's didn't Germany. We have, didn't we have a yeah. viewer in Antarctica? Do we? Let's I, let's. I thought we did. Like maybe a we can ago. find our viewers in Antarctica. Oh, it's gonna. I mean, they're watching from a two thousand foot structure. Yeah. Oh, where? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's somebody in Iceland. Nobody in Greenland. That's not the same. No. No. Well, Okay. <laughs> That's not not the same. <laughs> Listen to you. Okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to circumnavigate here, and you it doesn't. Do it. No, yeah, it's, it's in live mode, so it doesn't like interactivity. But hey, map.cat5.tv. I'm not see buying. It. I'm sorry. I, All right, Jeff doesn't buy it. Jeff I'm, doesn't buy it. Do you oh, buy I'm it? Game. I'm game. Is it a penguin, or is it a structure? It's. That's it's the question. Likely. Comment below. <laughs> it turns out. Free security solutions may come at the cost of all of your browsing data. Avast's free antivirus tracker, tracker tracks users' online behavior and mines the data for companies like Microsoft, Pepsi, and Google. Windows users should know by now that you're walking into a field of landmines if you run your computer without protection from malware. So most people use antivirus software to make sure that they get some much needed privacy and security protections while using their computers online. And many, to the tune of about a half billion users, turn to free antivirus products thinking that there's no reason to pay for protection since there are programs available for free. However, Free security suites can sometimes hoard your browsing data and other details and sell them to third parties. Mm -hmm. This is the case with the popular free antivirus from Avast, which is putting the privacy of around 400 million people at risk. At a time when high-profile tech executives are calling on governments to impose more stringent privacy rules, there's nothing like another reminder that everyone is fighting to get a hold of your habits, preferences, and pretty much any other data that can be used by advertisers to target you more easily. According to a joint investigation by Vice and PC Mag that involves leaked contracts and other companies, company documents, Avast, along with its AVG subsidiary, have been keeping track of what users did online while using the free software they distribute. The scheme involves JumpShot, a company that, quote, provides insights into consumers' online journeys by measuring every search, click, and buy across 1,600 categories from more than 150 sites, including Amazon, Google, Netflix, and Walmart, end quote. Installing Avast's free antivirus automatically adds in a browser extension that collects information on your internet activity and sends it to JumpShot, packed and tagged with the unique identifier. Avast data collection includes searches on Google and Google Maps, YouTube videos, LinkedIn searches and profile visits, and even what users view on adult websites. This gets sent to JumpShot's customers like Google, Microsoft, Pepsi, Sephora, Home Depot, Yelp, Intuit, and many others. Avast says it doesn't track any sensitive information like personal identification, phone numbers, or email. The company also insists that as of July 2019, they had begun implementing an explicit opt-in choice for all new downloads of their AV and are now prompting existing free users to make an opt-in or opt-out choice, a process which they claim will be completed in February 2020. Okay, opt in. Like, do you like, want like yes, 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 yes. Okay, I'm installing this free antivirus. Yes, 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 yes. Next, 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 next. Okay, you just opted in. Yeah. Bam, we have all your stuff. <sighs> and we're selling it to everyone. Mhm. Why does this come as a surprise to people? No, it's not a surprise, Jeff. It's just proven. Mhm. Free is never free. Well, exactly. I learned that as a kid. Mm. Nothing comes for free. Mm -hmm. If it's free, there's always something attached to it. Mm -hmm. Has Facebook not taught us anything? (laughs) They've taught us a lot, Jeff. We've learned so much. You know what? You know what I've learned by Facebook? Mm. That people just still use it. Yep. (laughs) People just still do it. Yep. Jeff, you're still on Facebook. Yeah. 
I, I am still on Facebook. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a necessary evil. But yeah. no. I, I, I don't use Avast for this reason. Anytime I see a free virus software, I go, uh uh. Antivirus. Antivirus, even. yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm not touching it. That's why I do use subscription based services mm -hmm. because when you're putting money behind it, there's a company that's going to actually stand behind their product as opposed to collecting your user data. Yeah, but there's Kaspersky and McAfee too. Sure. Well, exactly. Yes. But you could also get free versions of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. But putting money at it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. But it's right. much better than, hey, get this for free. Uh, it's like yeah. The, yeah. Because yeah. you're paying for it somehow. Yeah. So yeah, the I, free versions of these products are definitely going to have some some caveats to them for I, sure. I'm just wondering yeah. how long before we see some sort of uh, lawsuit. Yeah, I don't because know. the I interesting you thing in. you opted in, and, and opted it's in. a cop out because well, yeah, no, you no, the yes opt in was until 2000. Was it 19? Yeah, but they've retroactively added it to the system. Right, but everybody's anything, just going to hit okay. Opted, okay. Okay, 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 okay. That, yeah. you know, like, okay. I do. Oh, I got another pop up. Okay. Yeah. I'm the guy that reads the fine print before I sign up for something. Yeah. You're, you're not you're, you're not the average user though, Jeff. I know I'm not the average yeah. user. That, I'm just the suspicious the one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many people are doing this. So many people don't really realize what's happening. Yeah. And that now you know though, folks. Now you know. Yeah. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston.